Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about preventing, treating, and recovering from mental and substance use disorders within the context of the family. Joining us in our panel today are Francis Harding, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Nancy Young, Executive Director, Children and Family Futures, Irvine, California. Erica Aslin, Family Support Specialist and Medication Assisted Treatment Advocate, Fresh Start, Square One, Holyoke, Massachusetts. Dr. Kim Sumner Mayer, Senior Advisor, Phoenix House, Center on Addiction and the Family, New York, New York. Fran, what is the definition of family within our society currently? That's a very good question. Uh, family has changed the definition. We used to think of family as uh, two parents uh, living in a house with two children and probably a pet or two. Uh, now we have uh, a wide variety of families. So we have families that are uh, one parent, single parent, being raised by friends, being raised by um, grandparents, uh, relatives of all sorts. The, the good thing about that is it brings a, uh, the ability of a lot of diversity, a lot of ethnic cultures are different, and I think that it's across America we have uh, a lot better chance to have uh, family describe themselves in the way that's most comfortable for them. And Nancy, it goes even beyond that. It goes into um, same-sex parenting. It goes into a whole host of other issues, correct? Yeah, and I think what's important is, as Fran just said, you know, it's how the individual defines for themselves who is their family. Um, you know, I'm the adopted mother of two children, and I have also biological children, and I have a stepdaughter and, and grandson. So, you know, it's the way that I define my family and who's important to me for that support. Right. And, and Kim, it also depends on what society is, is doing to solve some of the problems that we're facing. Uh, families can be foster care. Family can be a whole other context Absolutely. as well within that realm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that probably the the best operational definition for family that comes to mind for me is it's a group of people who have established that they care about each other, they look to each other for support, they provide financial, emotional, housing support. It's, you know, where do you go for help when you're in trouble? And whose picture do you carry in your wallet? And whose birthday do you remember? And who matters to you? And Fran, how common are substance use and mental disorders among families? Um, it, it pretty much touches all families across the country in all different ways. Um, there is, a, you're, you either have a substance abuse uh, uh, or a mental health uh, disorder patient or consumer in your family leading the family. You could have uh, children. You could have an extended family um, operation. You could also be living in a community that the person that you consider to be part of your family, even though there is no blood connection, could also be impacting the family. So it's, it's a variety. It's uh, unlike uh, many other diseases and chronic conditions that we have. Okay. Erica, how can family members begin to recognize that there's either a substance use or a mental health uh, uh, issues of concern within the family? Well, I, I think that most in, uh, importantly that you, you notice behavior changes. Um, maybe their routine has changed or the people that they're spending time with is different. Start noticing that, you know, things aren't the same as they were. Maybe the, as a parent, they're not getting up with their children in the morning and making breakfast and getting them ready for school and putting them on the bus like they used to. And, you know, when things start to look different, that's when it could be a ragged flag. Um, and Fran, how important is it to prevention strategies to recognize the early signs? Very important. The earlier we can identify there's a problem in a family um, and then be able to start to begin to address it, and we'll talk later about the skills of being able to do that, we can prevent so many problems from happening. And for the, we can get somebody into treatment if they need it faster. We know that for young people, if we're able to um, 
postpone their use of alcohol and drugs, they have a much better life ahead of them. Mental health disorders can be diagnosed as early as 14. Often we're seeing signs as early as 11 and 12 that trigger that. So it's very important so that we can prevent problems before they begin. Absolutely. Nancy, within the context of family again, um, uh, what is the impact on the children of families where the adult may have an addiction problem or they may have a, a mental health problem? Well, I think it varies based on which of those kinds of families you're talking about. I think it's important for us to think about the larger population of children. And we know that actually about 8.3 million kids in our country live with a parent who's alcoholic or needs treatment for illicit drug abuse. That translates to 11%. Mm -hmm. If think about an elementary school classroom, that's three kids in every elementary school classroom. That's sort of mind boggling to think about how many kids are affected by uh, this particular addiction or, or illicit drug use in their family. So when we think about the ways that kids adapt to that and they cope with that, we can begin to see kids that do pretty well and may internalize what's going on in their family. They may not be vocal about it. They may not have the, the kinds of behavior things that would get attention in a school. Um, and then other kids may, may be those that start to act out and they are you know, replacing some of the attention that perhaps they needed at home uh, to try and seek that out by another adult. Uh, so I think it depends on which kind of situation you're dealing with and, and how that particular child is, is handling and learning to cope with that situation. And you at the center deal a lot with the foster care system and, and we're helping families to gain uh, a better sense of, of normality, whatever that may be, in mm -hmm. order to, to assist families in, in staying together. At what point does the system step in? Right, so our organization is the contractor to SAMHSA and co-funded by the Children's Bureau, the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. And in that role, we have seen many things happen that, that uh, the systems are working together in different ways to identify earlier so that families that may get a first report of neglect, most kids and most families that come to the attention of the child welfare system are there for reasons of neglect rather than abuse or sexual abuse. In fact, we've made great strides in the country in the last decade at reducing the, the numbers of kids with physical and sexual abuse, and yet we haven't really changed that, that number on how many kids are, are in the neglect category of those reports. Typically, we see that there are several reports before uh, child welfare steps in, in in active services. There may be some investigations that go on. They're very adept now at being able to look at risk and safety factors for the child to understand when that child is in imminent risk. What is imminent risk so that our audience understands what we're talking about? So child welfare, CPS workers, child protective service workers, uh, have ways that they look at the risk factors in a family. Imminent risk is this is something that is critical and the child must be removed from that family right now in order to keep that child safe. So there's safe. danger to their there's life? There's danger to their physical life, to uh, their safety, uh, meaning that the, the risk of who else is in the household uh, can't be controlled so that there might be something going on that they need to say, right now we need to make this removal. But there's about 200,000, a little more than 200,000 children removed each year, whereas there are about 3 million children that are investigated for abuse and neglect. And within those 200,000, are there cases where they're removed where, where the parents are having either a mental or substance use disorder? The vast majority. The vast majority. Yeah. Okay. And Yvette, may I go yes. back and kind of piggyback on what Nancy was saying? You started by describing sort of what it looks like for a child who's in school and how they may present. And so um, to say what's happening at home in those situations, if you have a parent with a substance abuse problem, very often you're seeing children whose developmental needs are not the primary concern. So the family is very oriented around meeting the parent's needs and keeping the family functioning around the parent's addiction. So rather than the child getting what they need developmentally, 
mentally, the family is really kind of putting the child's needs last in order to keep the family just functioning. And so that sometimes means that um, children are actually flipping roles with their parents and becoming parentified, where they're, they're in a role that's not appropriate for them. The lines of authority are not clear, or they change depending on whether the parent is high or, or not mm -hmm. high. Um, so there's a lot of inconsistency for children. Uh, so Fran, let, let me go back. A child that is within one of these families, uh, they're dealing with, with a problem, many of them themselves, mm -hmm. in order to adapt, either develop a mental or a substance use pattern themselves. Okay. How, how, how do, how, what, what happens in that dynamic? I think Kim described it very well with the d total dysfunction of the family. And the family, if, it's, if we don't intervene and find ways to go in and bring services to help them, the child can then get so confused and so frustrated from trying to be a parent and being a child at the same time, they separate themselves from their peers. And then they become frustrated and depressed and look for other outlets to get attention. As where the parents, they go through a similar issue, they get frustrated and they have a guilt-ridden uh, inner core that then p possibly brings them closer to having a becoming a depressed state or possibly medicating themselves to make them feel better. So we have to get services in there. We have to get education so that we can begin to link the services and begin to intervene as quickly as possible. And when we come back, we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, the dynamics of a family that faces substance and mental uh, disorders. We'll be right back. When a family member has a substance abuse or mental disorder, it has a profound impact on the family unit. Uh, whether it's the young person who's having uh, a, an issue and its impact on the siblings and on the parents and their time and effort, their ability to get treatment and, and help that individual recover. But it's also uh, what happens when a young person has a parent or a, an adult in their life who is struggling with addiction or who has a mental disorder. So helping the family unit deal with um, what's going on in the family as opposed to dealing with just the individual who's having the uh, illness or the addiction is really critical. When the family discovers that a family member has a uh, mental health problem or substance use problem, uh, the response of the family depends on their awareness of the family about the nature of conditions. Um, Families where there's a genetic environmental history uh, may be more attuned to uh, acting more promptly uh, in an effort to uh, acquire assistance or help for the affected individual because they've been there, done that, they recognize what's going on. If the family is naive about these conditions, the, again, the initial reaction may be one of denial, uh, self-recrimination, uh, um, feeling that somehow they've done something wrong, or conversely, maybe one of anger at how dare this person behave in such a way and shame or look what they're doing, depending on the cultural context and depending on the situation. So there are a, the full range of emotions associated with recognizing uh, that there's a, a problem. People who suffer from drug or alcohol addiction sometimes say hurtful things. They drive the people who love them most away. If you know someone who suffers from drug or alcohol addiction, listen. Try to hear what they are really saying. Know that there is hope and help them find their voice again. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I've used methadone as my treatment for my, my disease of addiction. And by doing so, I've been able to help other mothers that are on medication-assisted treatment. And I think what the great thing about it is, is that because I've already walked that road, that in working with these mothers, I get to bring them hope and to show them the light at the end of the tunnel and, and in some ways light that path for them so that they can begin on their journey and, and walk down that path towards 
towards a beautiful life with their children in recovery. And Erica, um, does all of this seem familiar to you, uh, the whole area of, of family dysfunction and, and substance and mental health issues? Very much so. Um, I myself am in recovery and I am uh, the parent to six children. And um, my family, my I became um, using alcohol and that roller coastered and into other substances and it was very hard to keep the family dynamic together and my how early uh, in your age uh, I, I started using alcohol originally when i was 14 years old but kind of took a break from that during my pregnancies and i um i picked up again at age 25 and started drinking on a daily basis and um that turned into cocaine use and other substances from there uh, but what really ended up happening was my my children paid the price for that, that I wasn't able to be present for them and do the things that I needed to do. And I think what was most difficult about it was because of the stigma around being a mother and having an addiction and, um, and a family, that I wasn't able to seek treatment when I needed to. And when it came time that, that Child Protective Services became involved in my life, I, I didn't have the courage to admit that I had a problem, so I hid it. So instead of getting the treatment I needed, my children paid the price and they were removed. And what was that aha moment for you where you said, this is it, I really need to, to get into help? Well, what ended up happening for me was I ended up losing, um, signing over my parental rights to my oldest children and giving guardianship of my youngest two to their paternal grandmother and I really hit rock bottom after that and it was very hard for me to even have a reason to live at that point. I had gone from being a mother of four to an absolute nothing. I had no reason to wake up in the morning um, and no coping skills whatsoever. But I, I ended up becoming pregnant again and it was at that moment that I said I'm not willing to sacrifice another life due to my addiction and I immediately sought treatment and I have been in treatment and have been clean and sober ever since. That's wonderful. And That's great. you know, I took that opportunity and ran with it and I, I ran as far away from that dark side of my life as I possibly could. And I've taken that the the skills that I learned from being an addict and I use them in my work with helping other mothers in That's recovery. That's excellent. Fran, uh, basically beyond what Erica has already said in terms of losing children and the costs, what other costs to society uh, uh, are there in terms of families that are experiencing mental or substance use oh, disorders? There are several, um, almost too many to mention. Um, we have uh, young, if you start with the young kids, you start with the children, the cost to society is that they often, um, we need extra cost to help them learn. They haven't had the type of parenting and, and discipline in the home to be able to keep up with their schoolwork. Um, so they're behind, so that causes extra costs. Oftentimes, children uh, in troubled homes that have addiction and, and mental health issues, um, they drop out early. And that's a huge cost to, to our society because they often then are not able to be employed. Parents, um, uh, just like Eric was saying, uh, sometimes uh, because of the discrimination that's out there with people with uh, substance use disorders and uh, mental health uh, disorders, uh, they won't get jobs. And so they, it's very hard for them to raise families. So you end up with a greater illness, you end up with costs around education, you end up with costs around uh, relapse when um, everything else begins again. So it, it's a revolving door of extra medical and societal costs. Let's talk a little bit about how we get families help. Uh, Kim, talk to us about family therapy and, and what is it and describe it for us. Sure. Well, family therapy is no one particular approach. It's really a collection of approaches to helping people make changes. And what these approaches all have in common is, is a belief in family level assessment and treatment. And by that, we look at families as a system. So a system is something that has many different parts that interact with each other and all the parts have to be working well in order for the system to do its job. So family therapists look at the way individual family members function and how the family, the parts of the family, the individuals, the relationships all work together. So we're interested in how individual behavior affects the whole and how the whole affects individual behavior. And we use relationships really as the site of intervention and the lever. Um, and really when it comes to addiction treatment, 
we're looking at two things. We're looking at what strengths and resources does the family have to bring to bear to help improve the recovery outcomes. And secondly, how can we use how can we bring family members together in order to heal from some of the effects of the addiction? So if I could go back to Erica's story, amazing story, by the way, you. Um, much respect to you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, she said that um, you had said that the, your addiction had gotten so severe by the time you sought help. It's so common for mothers in particular not to seek help at the first signs because of stigma around treatment. Um, so it got really bad and your children had been removed by the time you sought treatment. You were already in a very low place. Mm -hmm. And then when your children were removed, you experienced a tremendous well of grief and loss that plunged you down and probably in your, you said that's when you bottomed out. Very common. So, but you said you used, you, once you entered treatment, you used a lot of your strengths and you learned a lot of skills. So family therapists would be interested in what are those, what are the strengths, what are the shining points, the exceptions to the problem story in this family that we can use to leverage. So I'd be interested in who was in your support network and how did they help identify things like um, warning signs that you were headed in the wrong direction. So we leverage those strengths in family therapy. Um, Very good. Uh, Fran, in terms of family therapy, how is it being integrated into the overall health care given the, the reforms that we're, that we're undergoing? Many of our services are now being looked at for coverage in, uh, in general health, health insurance. Uh, we have a long ways to go. Uh, we are trying, uh, SAMHSA is actually one of the, is being quite the leader in helping our general health field and our insurance companies to be able to see that um, family therapy, educational classes, um, other uh, medical and uh, psychological services are indeed very appropriate for the um, the consumers and the patients and the family members and uh, people that are in long-term recovery, as it were, uh, to get all those services covered. We have a long ways to go, uh, but we are working very hard to get the country ready for uh, 2014 when health reform will actually take hold in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. And we'll have uh, so many more thousands of Americans that will have uh, health insurance coverage that they've never had. We know from the research that when family therapy is integrated with substance abuse treatment, outcomes are enhanced. We know that we have better rates of engaging people in treatment, better rates of keeping people in treatment when they would otherwise drop out, improved long-term outcomes, lowering societal costs of addiction, actually decreasing rates of domestic violence in families, and, and decreasing or lessening the effects of addiction on children and therefore interrupting that intergenerational cycle. Oh, that's wonderful. Nancy, talk to me about the uh, children and family uh, futures and what they're doing to really help to integrate new approaches to reduce the number of, of uh, individuals that lose their children. Well, we, we work with community members and the child welfare system, the addiction treatment and the mental health ser ser service system to ensure that they are communicating, that when a child uh, is um, identified as having a parent with either a, a mental or a substance use disorder, that that child is put I, I loved the way that Erica um, framed that she wasn't there enabled, it wasn't present to be able to take care of her, her children. And I, I resonate with that because I am the child of a mother with a serious mental illness. And I think we sometimes think of this as only being about addicted families. And yet those children in which parents have a mental health issue are also those that, that exhibit some of those same kinds of things. So when we're, when we're looking at what is happening in the life of that child, when is the issue of neglect such that a formal system has to, to step in? And yet there's many things that community members church members, the faith community, uh, school staff, you know, the, the individual that takes a, a young child and mentors that child uh, can play just as an important role as the, the formal system. And we're going to take a look at exactly that. How do we take a young person and, and how does society insulate that young person that may be experiencing a dysfunctional family uh, scenario? We'll be right back.
before, addiction and depression kept me from living my life. And now, every step I take in recovery benefits everyone. There are many options that make the road to recovery more accessible. It begins with the first step. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I think the Exodus program is a rare opportunity. It's one of those one in a million shots where you know you don't think that a place like this exists. The Exodus program is a all around supportive environment providing a safe and nurturing atmosphere for the families. We feel that the families progress through the program living life on life's terms because they experience everyday living. They take care of their children, they cook for their children, they get their children up to go to school. So the benefit of being in a one-shop model where everything is on site is such a benefit to the families. I think overall the families here at the Exodus program um, respond really well to just the genuine concern that our staff displays to them on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the, the things that we try to do as early on as possible is to try to have our clients develop a real positive support system, whether it be through church, through meetings, through other peers that are here at the program, reconnecting with their family members. Uh, I think that's definitely the first step. Well, having a place to live and being around other families that are like ours is very helpful because I feel like we get to help each other and it's not just me getting help. I, I see that I'm not alone. I enjoy that all our family is together. Everybody's focused and doing what they're supposed to do. And I mean, it just makes us feel comfortable knowing that we have somewhere safe to be. I would say the most important things that I'm learning about my recovery is that there is hope, there is help. You learn something new every day, especially when you're doing it under a clean and sober mind. It's a big difference. You learn how to deal with life situations as they come at you in a positive manner, in a positive aspect, and that's the best thing that I seem to learn every day. I learn how to be a mother the way a mother should be. The Heroes and Cheerios Youth Prevention Program was developed to serve the 5 through 18 year old youth of the parents that are receiving substance abuse services through Shields for Families. That program is a culturally enriched environment in which the children come to an after school program when they um, leave their elementary school and are provided tutoring, mentoring, one on one homework assistance. It's just a wonderful, supportive. Um, leg for the families to have. We want to encourage these youth to go to school, um, further their education, and let them know that anything that they want is attainable. We also want to bring back the families. You know, we want to make sure that they are cohesive and they work well with each other. And in addition, we also want to build the community as a whole. We respect our clients. We value our clients' opinions about the services that are provided, and we listen real well to what our clients have as in reference to input. And we recognize that our families bring a host of strengths to the table, and we try to capitalize on what their strengths are. Having a, a community of people who are also in recovery helps our clients learn to, to let go of that guilt and shame that they have um, regarding their addiction and that they're now in recovery and that that's what they should really be proud of. And I go through this and I sit with the women and I talk to them and we go through our individuals and I hear it over and over. The women say all the time, I need my kids more than they need me. I need my kids, I need my kids. So that's one of our biggest goals is to reunite family and keep families together. Family-centered treatment is the way to be. 
I don't understand why everyone's not doing it across the board because it showed to be more effective. Um, I just I just think it should be more programs like Heroes and Cheryl's in order for uh, many more families to be touched. So Kim, we were talking about the adolescent and other institutions that can actually come in and, and act as a, uh, a beginning of a buffer mm -hmm. for that adolescent. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, about that. Sure. Well, I think um, just about every setting a child exists in, there, there are caring adults available, or there can be caring adults available, who can um, be a protective factor to a child um, and help that child um, access their own inner resilience. So um, including things like helping children realize that they can use humor, um, that they can develop close relationships with safe adults, um, teaching children ways that they can be safe. Okay, if it's if it's if you can't bring friends home because crazy things are happening there and you can't study there, how can we put something in place so that you have a safe place to go after school? If you're concerned about your siblings, then how can we make sure that their needs get met? So, I really I think we just need to um, encourage adults to not ignore signs that a child is struggling and reach out to children um, and to kids to say, if you have one caring adult in your life who's in your corner, that can make all absolutely. the difference for you. No, I absolutely think so. And, and you know, the, the issue is that today the school systems are really so overburdened by mm -hmm. so many uh, uh, budget considerations and cuts, you know, to social workers and cuts to this and that. And yet, you know, as you mentioned, just that one person, because oftentimes, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert, the child may think that it's their fault what's mm -hmm. happening in the home. Absolutely. I think the messages that we give children about what's happening, I think children can handle straight talk about their problems at home if we deliver it to them in ways that are age appropriate. So um, we often talk uh, in the context of uh, children who have an addicted parent or children who have a parent with mental um, illness problems, we talk about the three C's, um, making sure that children understand that the three C's are you did not cause this, you cannot control it, and you cannot cure it, um, so that they understand that they, they, are, they neither have the power nor the responsibility to fix this problem, but they can communicate about what's happening. They can take care of themselves. They can be healthy and successful despite the difficulties that are happening at home. Yeah. And um, Erica, I want to go to the point that you made when at the point where your children are taken from you, how did that reintegration occur and, and what did you do as a parent to really begin to heal your family? Um, I think what was most important for me was to, to realize that I needed to, to help, I needed help in that, um, to forgive myself before I could really begin to heal in order to help heal my children. I had to acknowledge that I had to take care of myself before I could take care of them. And, and that was what I feel was most important. And then when I really got the opportunity to talk about it with them, to explain to the, my children that it wasn't their fault and that I was sick and that you know there was things that I had to learn how to cope with and that no matter what, I love them and that they are my world and they are what's important, but in no way was it their fault. And it wasn't until I had that conversation with them that we really began to heal and, and become a family again and move on with our lives. And then they, they could begin to trust again. Mm, definitely, you know, they, they've learned that, that they have confidence that it wasn't, there wasn't anything that they could have done differently and that it's okay for them to, to have the feelings that they're feeling and I've, I've opened up a, an environment for them where it's okay for them to tell me how they feel and talk about what they experienced during my time of addiction and that um, validate their feelings and that it's okay and they have learned how to trust and move on and are, are doing fantastic in school and have just really become amazing children despite the trauma that they experienced at a young age. And this is a key word, Fran, trauma. That is, that is really the, 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 the main issue here. Um, the, the notion that the kids are traumatized and that trauma really does take a long time uh, for folks to heal, correct? Correct, and uh, trauma has uh, a lot of, uh, there's an extended definition of trauma. We used to think of trauma very narrowly, and now we're seeing that 
both in, in several different cultures and in this situation of families with young people living with addictions and mental illness, uh, the trauma can be su very subtle and doesn't show up until they're adults. Uh, the trauma can be very severe and needs to be intervened with right away. So there, there are all different levels of trauma, but the good news is we also know so much more. And we are, um, all these services that are being described today, um, they're the key factor for all of them for me um, in prevention is collaboration. We must continue to collaborate and to bring these services together to bear and that it takes more than just one intervention, one person in treatment, uh, one school that's attentive um, to be able for the entire community to wrap themselves around. Talk a little bit about the protective factors that folks need to be aware of in terms of providing that preventive uh, approach to, well, to families. Well, first, the protective factors, uh, as Kim was saying, it, it's in the family them itself, and you have to find where that is. And, and family therapy, as was described, as well as having a faith-based organization come in and having the contact, depending upon who you are, where you live, what your culture is, um, they, we uh, will identify what are the strengths, what are the protective factors, uh, which are the strengths and the resilience. And then you continue to build that out, because every member of the family has a strength. Uh, it doesn't always kind of coordinate well sometimes when the family's disruptive. That's when you bring in the other sources. So there is uh, several, um, you know, parenting skills, uh, young people skills of knowing when to say, uh, I need help, knowing when to uh, say, I, I can't do this anymore, and go to that protective uh, adult. Um, a trusting adult. There's the schools are a protective factor. The community is a huge faith-based. There, there is many of them. It's an endless, endless, endless sources. Kim, I, I want to go back. We had a, a conversation off camera about military families. Mm -hmm. As we look at the returning members of the military, the veterans that are coming back, uh, what special challenges should service delivery systems be on the lookout for? Okay, well, I'd say, um, first of all, when, when military service people come back, um, they, they've had, especially if they've been in combat, they've had experiences that may be extremely horrific, and they're very invested in protecting their family from the impact of that, which often leads them to a kind of a secrecy or isolation around that, both because they think no one can understand their experience and because they want to protect their loved ones from it. But it's hard enough to reintegrate into your family after being through that, but then to feel like you have to, you can't talk about it with family or with other people makes that reintegration even more difficult. Um, while the soldier has been or the service person has been away, the family has also adapted to their not being present. Um, the, the other parent, if, it's, if they have children, has learned to do a lot of things on their own. Maybe he or she has, has taken financial responsibility on all by themselves, and now the service person returns and they have to kind of share that role. So there are a lot of shifts and changes in roles. The service person may be dealing with psychological wounds or physical wounds or brain wounds um, that uh, make services, professional services necessary for them. And the service providers have to understand the unique military culture that, uh, that they need in order to heal. Very good. Nancy, let me shift a little bit about, and let's start talking about the family uh, drug courts. Talk, oh, talk to us a little yeah. bit about that and, you, you and, and, and what uh, that does to really facilitate a, a, a positive process within dysfunctional families. Yeah, you asked earlier about some of the things that the National Center is doing, and we're, we're happy that there's this kind of approach that is relatively new, just starting in, in 1996, but uh, it really takes the child protective service system and the family court and the substance abuse treatment providers and addresses the whole family. So just as Fran was saying, the importance of collaboration, what does that actually mean when you're working with a particular family? And importantly, what does that mean for all of the families? So it uses some key concepts about making sure that we can identify families with substance abuse and mental health problems as they're entering the child protective service system uh, quicker, getting them access to services quicker, making sure that each of the family members has a, a support system has a, a treatment plan when needed, uh, uses the, the court, the family court, 
to more carefully monitor what is going on in the treatment plan, particularly around the parent and their substance use disorder and the child and how the child's permanency and the relationships that, that they must develop are being uh, provided for them so that the, the child and the parent uh, is seen as the, the unit of intervention, which is so important. Very good. When we come back, I want to continue on uh, and identify other sources that families can go to in order to get help. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Where's mom? Did she forget me? I wonder what happened to her. What if I get left here? Drugs and alcohol may make you forget your problems for a moment, but that's not all you forget. My mother worked hard to be in recovery, and I love her for that. For drug and alcohol treatment for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Bridging Resources and Communities, BRIC is the acronym. We, uh, as the name implies, we bridge resources and communities with a prevention focus. Our primary role is to partner with great organizations like the Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative. The mission of the Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative is to be a catalyst uh, for the Ward 8 community, really helping the community coalesce around issues of families uh, and children and the issues that they deal with. I think that any time there's an issue within the family, the entire family is impacted. Whether it's mental health, substance abuse, HIV, whatever it is, if one family member is impacted, then it impacts the entire family. Family really is anybody that you can rely on, any resource that you have at your disposal to build your own strengths. You do have to look at the whole picture because if you're constantly just focusing on the children or the youth, and not their parents or other caregivers, then when they go home, there's gonna be a disconnect. And if you have a youth that's using substance, that can be dramatic on the parents, on the whole entire family as well, because that individual can impact the family. The family is a part of the treatment process. The person that's getting the treatment themselves is just one individual, but the family has actually been impacted you know, by the substance abuse or mental health abuse or whichever one it is. So I think it's important to have the family together as a whole so the treatment plan can work well for the family and the individual that's getting the treatment. Within this community right now, uh, there's a poverty rate of close to 50%. The unemployment rate is the highest in the country at 35%. Um, we have a huge uh, rate of HIV and AIDS. Um, uh, PCP is huge in this community. Violence is huge in this community. So really, it starts with a family unit. And we believe that uh, youth and families are, are key to the success of this community. One thing that BRIC has been very successful in doing is fostering really good relationships with our federal and local partners. The goal is to establish with as many partners in the community as possible because that builds the coalition, builds the reputation, and builds the relationships. One of those programs uh, is what we call community diverted cases. So a lot of times there are issues uh, in families where CFSA has to be involved, but it's not raised to the level where a uh, youth has to automatically be removed or something like that. So one of our jobs here is to work with that family to try to keep them together and provide the services that uh, help them and support them in staying together. We do um, job placement, we do education stuff, we do all the things that a family might need in order to become self-sufficient. There's some very, um, talented, very passionate people, very educated, very intelligent people, but they're just living in an environment with lack of resources. I have five girls and three boys, and they um, helped me get in them, they helped me get them into um, an after school program, and also aftercare, and summer programs for them in the summer, so they won't have to be around the neighborhood so much. Ward 8 is a, um, 
a, a really strong community and it has a lot of strengths within this community and a lot of times uh, the people within this community aren't given credit for that and so our job is to really try to build those families up remove any barrier to them being successful because a lot of times there there are enough barriers in people's lives so just the distance can be a barrier travel can be a barrier you know unfamiliar areas can be a barrier eliminating those at all costs because eventually we don't want to have to be here. We want to be able to just utilize the resources that were in this community uh, for them to rely on. The strength of our partners, the strength of the relationships in our community, to me, is the crux of what we do. It, it, is, it, is, our, it is why we're able to do what we do. I love the fact that I can meet a person and the person can be unemployed, he can be homeless, he can have mental health issues, he can be on substance abuse, and I can still see him and say, you can still be what you want to be in spite of that. The collaborative have helped me and my family. They're still continuously helping me and my family. And the resources here, if a lot of other people knew about it, they would feel the same way I do. At Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative, we're here as a family, and we treat you as a family when you come in. If your heart is there, you're willing to help the families, I think we can make a great impact in the Ward A community. Erica, talk a little bit about what you do and how families can access uh, your services. So what I do, as I am a family support specialist, and, and what my program does is we provide um, peer engagement workers. We're all in recovery ourselves, and we go out to the family, and we talk with the mother, and we really, um, we, we get on her level, and we assess her needs and what the family needs and what we can do to help them continue in their recovery, and we really work on making sure that they have access to all the resources in the community. And, and on top of that, we, we do our best to coordinate care with all their other services, like you were talking about with collaborating. You know, I think it's really important for our families, most of them have involvement with the Department of Children and Families, and you know, so we stay in close contact with, with the department, with their worker, and with their therapists, and with their treatment providers, and we make sure that everybody stays on the same page. And in doing that, our families have been very successful. We have 91% of our families stay in our program and stay engaged, and they've done a wonderful job. And on top of that, we provide parenting classes, oh, and it, which is the biggest piece, because being a mother in recovery myself, it's so hard to balance your recovery and staying sober, and, and then you want to be the best parent you can possibly be because you're trying to make up for lost time and all these other things. So to uh, the fact that our program offers parenting classes I think is amazing, and it really t teaches the person in recovery how to parent their child and when to ask for help and what to, what to do with your children while you're in recovery. And Kim, talking about when to ask for help, a lot of families do not ask for help because they feel they would be stigmatized right. and they, they, it would either affect their job status or their community status or mm -hmm. their neighborhood status. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I think that stigma is a huge problem that keeps people from seeking services. And so um, one of the things that I love so much about um, what Erica and I were talking in the green room is, is how she as a person in recovery can reach out to other mothers to, to really bust through the stigma and say treatment works and I'm living proof of it and, um, and I am your peer. Um, so reducing the sense of hierarchy. And I just think that we constantly need to be aware that people are bigger than their problems. Um, we need to see the humanity in the families that come before us and say, I know that you have difficulties, but you also have resources and strengths. So come and get the help that you need. And Fran, exactly that. From a prevention standpoint, when people start seeing some of the warning signs, where can they seek help? They can seek help by going to our website. Um, I think it's the fastest uh, way for them to uh, find out throughout the country because it's a we're a uh, federal uh, website. We're nationally known. We have um, uh, the ability to go into every every state, every territory, um, every jurisdiction, and sh point you to directions like the programs that we're talking about today instead of listing them out. Um, I think it's important for us in prevention to help our families and our individual, our young people, to know that that 
those resources are out there for them and it's easy access. This is the day and the time for everything to be on the web. Um, it's very easy now. Um, it's much more difficult to motivate yourself to make that um, push that button on the computer than it is to actually access help. And what they'll be accessing is uh, help with uh, coalitions that can help them or? For prevention, it's all it's all the above. It's, but I, I would highly recommend looking at the whole continuum of services because what we're talking about here is a family with multiple parts and there are people that would need some coalition attention, being able to feel useful again by being a member of a community organization. Uh, young people wanting to um, become part of a group uh, in, in their school, whether it's a group because their family got sp separated, which is very common uh, in, in our business, or whether it's just a group to be a leader and to bring out some of those skills. And then, of course, our array of treatment uh, services uh, on multiple levels. And then, of course, our last, all of the resources and the services are, are coming alive and supported around recovery support. Yes. And I think recovery support is going to help us quicker than everything we've done so far in helping to reduce this discrimination against people with substance abuse and mental health disorders. And getting back to the court system, I think that the more the courts get engaged, really, mm -hmm. they have helped tremendously yeah. in the whole issue of stigma. They've almost got it to a point where, where people begin to see that it's not a moral issue, it's not a really a criminal issue, but it's an issue of a disease that, uh, diseases, both mental and, and, and substance use, that have to be managed. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we have a lot of hope that before families get to the court system, either the family court or the criminal court, that they're reaching out to others. The, the power of uh, mutual help and, and peers helping peers, both within adolescents and younger children, but parents helping other parents. Um, you know, the formal system is extremely important to be there with uh, with treatment and recovery supports uh, but the the power of of what Erica is doing with reaching out and really offering that I've been there I understand uh, you can do it I did it uh, and uh, someone said to me that what they really got when they engaged with the parent partner was hope uh, that, their, that their life could change, that their family could change, that they could parent their children, and that there was a way out. Because in the, in the depths of the addiction or the mental illness, you really don't see what's, what's the path? How do I get out of this? What is there uh, besides jail or uh, besides institutions? So the, the power of mutual aid, I don't think, can be understood or understated, rather. Can I add something to that? We've been talking a lot about prevention and some about treatment, but I, I always like to say one of my mantras is aftercare should not be an afterthought. We're talking about the continuum of, of family recovery. And so for those families that have engaged in treatment, the time period after treatment is absolutely critical to them. And services to help families navigate the changes in family relationships need to start before they, they end their services. And then so that when inevitably the honeymoon ends um, and the parent begins to think, oh no, this was supposed to be easier, now it's harder, so that the parent doesn't withdraw uh, and, and become isolated again. And again, you know, their, their risk of relapse goes way up at that point. And if it's an adolescent that's been in treatment, same thing. It takes a long time for families to make changes at the relationship level. So aftercare needs to be thought of in advance. Aftercare should not be an afterthought. Very good point. And I think it's also very important to stress during the aftercare that, you know, the, the importance of a support system. Mm -hmm. Recovery changes from the first year to the second year to the fifth mm -hmm. year to the tenth mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an ongoing process. And through that process, no matter where you're at, if you're at the beginning or if you're, you're 20 years into it, you need people behind you that are there to support you at all steps. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, when you're having those difficult moments that you can say, you know, today was a rough day and, and you know, I, I need your support. And it's just crucial to continue supporting that family in recovery in all aspects of it. And Erica, let me ask you a question. If I know of a family member, I'm not in the immediate family, but if I know of a family member that has a problem, 
How should I approach getting or seeking help for that individual? I think that the, the best way to go about it is to, to really educate yourself first and to gather information about the resources in your community to help that family member, but then to approach that family member, you know, face to face on a on a you know mutual level and and tell them that you you think that they might be having a problem and to not go at them with judgment or um, to look down on them, but to just really say, you know, I think that you're having a hard time right now, and I've come up with these resources to help you, and why don't we do this together? Very good. Uh, Nancy, final thoughts. Well, I think part of what Erica said with reaching out to that family member is so important for each of us to seek the formal system when needed, uh, but to act with compassion. Uh, it could be any one of us, and to act with compassion when it's not your immediate family, but someone in your neighborhood. Uh, that that's really what that individual needs at that point is a conversation and how uh, you feel and how that can be beneficial for that person to see their behavior in connection with their, their larger family and their community. Friend, final thoughts? Um, I'll build off uh, of what Nancy said. I think uh, for me it's the knowing where to look for help. And I think you can, the formal system for me is the states. Everyone lives the states ahead of a territory or ahead or a tribal elder. And we have to remember that the states and the communities must work together in collaboration. And that, but at the same time, we have to keep focused on the level of care each individual needs in a family. Not everybody needs the same services, but if we work together both outside the home and inside the home. And the last thought is we've done a lot of talking about addiction. Addiction has been learning very very quickly from the consumers of mental health. And I think people who are, have been living or are living with mental health disorders, their consumer, they call themselves consumers, and this movement is teaching us a lot about bringing these resources together. Kim. Recovery is a process. It is not an event. It unfolds over time and it changes over time. And so the services and the supports that are needed will change over time. And furthermore, it is a family process. So it needs to be addressed as a family process. We cannot treat only the individual. We have to look at the relationships. Well, I want to remind everyone that National Recovery Month happens every September. I hope that you visit our website and are able to access all of the materials so that in September you're able to create a small, medium, or large event in your community. Thank you for being with us. It was Thank a great you. show. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.